I am speaking to you from in front of Kilmainham Jail. The time is just after midnight, 12.10 to be exact. The date, Friday, May the 12th, 1916. Less than two weeks have passed since the end of the Easter Rising. During that time, 13 men prominently involved in the Rising have been executed by firing squads. And to date, 74 others have received prison sentences ranging from life to one year. Yesterday, May the 11th, the following announcement was issued by the authorities. The trials by court-martial of those who took an actual part in the Rising in Dublin are practically finished. Now, according to unofficial sources, James Connolly and Sean McDermott the two surviving signatories of the Easter Proclamation who were sentenced to death on May the 9th are to be executed. As we have just seen, Commandant Connolly's wife and daughter have arrived by ambulance at Dublin Castle, presumably to visit the Commandant who is still a patient in the military hospital there as a result of his leg wound sustained during the Rising. It hardly seems possible that James Connolly, seriously wounded, and Sean McDermott, maimed by a childhood attack of infantile paralysis, are to be put in front of a firing squad. Well, so-called reliable sources have been wrong before, and they may be wrong this time. No, 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 none of this. Do you want to unman me? Your beautiful life, James, your beautiful life. Hasn't it been a good life? And isn't this a good end? Nora. Nora, there's nothing to cry for. I won't cry, Papa. You're a good girl, Nora. Lily, did I tell you about the man during the week of the Rising who wanted to come into the post office to buy a penny stamp? Of course, we told him to be on his way. Well, says he, it's a queer state of affairs in Dublin City when a man can't buy a postage stamp in the post office. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? Isn't it, Nora? Only five minutes more. Oh, my God. Oh, oh hush. Hush, 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 hush. You know, my only complaint is that tonight was the first night I got a wink of sleep with this leg the way it is. And they had to waken me with this news. No matter, no matter. It was all worthwhile. A good, clean fight. And it'll stop recruiting. Maybe now, Irishmen will realize the foolishness of fighting for another country's freedom when their own is in bondage. No. We can't fail now. Oh, oh, Mama, please, don't. Mama, come on. Mama, please, come on. Come on, Mama. Come on. There, now. There, up. Here, Mama, take some of this. Come on. Take some of that. You're a good girl, Nora. I'm proud of you. The rising lasted for five days, two hours, and 30 minutes. Approximately 1,500 people were either killed or severely wounded. Nearly 200 buildings in central Dublin were destroyed. Sackville Street, one of the most beautiful thoroughfares in Europe, now lies in ruins. Landmarks such as the Imperial Hotel and the DBC building, such well-known shops as Cap and Peterson's, Cleary's, Noblet's, Eason's, Hopkins and Hopkins, Gallagher's, all these, incredibly, have ceased to exist. Nearly a thousand people are homeless. One third of the city's population have had to be given public relief. Within three days after the surrender, courts martial were set up. Among the first of the insurgents to be tried and sentenced were P.H. Pierce, Thomas McDonough and T.J. Clark. The charge was one of assisting the enemy. The enemy, of course, being the Imperial German government. Witnesses, police and military, were brought against each of the accused, who was then invited 
to speak in his own defense. Then the trial was over. There were no witnesses for the defense and the accused men were not represented. I admit that I was Commodore General, commanding in chief of the forces of the Irish Republic, which have been acting against you for the past week, and that I was president of the provisional government. I stand over all my acts and words done or spoken in these capacities. When I was a child of 10, I went down on my bare knees by my bedside one night and promised God that I should devote my life to an effort to free my country. I have kept that promise. We seem to have lost. We have not lost. To refuse to fight would have been to lose. To fight is to win. We have kept faith with the past and handed a tradition to the future. Later that day, May the 2nd, the three accused were told that they had been sentenced to death. Just before dawn on the following morning, Pierce wrote a last letter to his mother. You asked me to write a little poem which would seem to be said by you about me. I have written it, and a copy is in Arbor Hill Barracks with other papers. I do not grudge them, Lord, I do not grudge my two strong sons that I have seen go out to break their strength, they and a few, in bloody protest for a glorious thing. They shall be spoken of among their people. The generations shall remember them and call them blessed. I hope soon to see Papa, and in a little while, we shall all be together again. I have not words to tell you of my love for you and how my heart yearns for you all. I will call to you in my heart at the last moment. The same volley killed Pierce, Clark, and McDonough. Clark was a shopkeeper. McDonough, like Pierce, was a teacher and a poet. He wrote, his songs were a little phrase of eternal song, drowned in the harping of lays more loud and long. But his song's new soul shall shrill the loud harps dumb, and his deed the echoes fill when the dawn is come. That was on the morning of May 3rd. Late that evening, a young woman, heavily veiled, entered the shop of a jeweler in Grafton Street. The young woman was Miss Grace Gifford, Joseph Plunkett's fiancée. At 1.30 on the following morning, Plunkett and Miss Gifford were married in the chapel at Kilmainham Jail. After the ceremony, the couple were separated. They met again, however, in Plunkett's cell for ten minutes, just before dawn. Joseph Plunkett, Edward Daly, Michael O'Hanrahan and William Pierce, younger brother of P.H. Pierce, died together on the morning of May 4th. On Friday, May 5th, Major John McBride was executed. Major McBride, a naturalized citizen of the Transvaal, fought in the Boer War, during which time he married Miss Maud Gaughan. On May 6th, the Countess Markovitz was sentenced to death, but this was commuted to life imprisonment. On Monday, May 8th, Cornelius Colbert, Eamon Kant, J.J. Houston, and Michael Mallon were executed. Of these men, three were clerks, Michael Mallon, was a weaver. On May 9th, for his part in a shooting near Fermoy, Thomas Kent was executed. Yesterday, a sentence of death on Eamon de Valera was commuted to one of life imprisonment. Thirteen men have been shot by firing squads. Possibly two more will die at dawn. The next hour or so will tell. We have just learned that Mrs. James Connolly and Miss Nora Connolly have left the hospital at Dublin Castle and are returning home. How is the outside world reacting to news of these executions? We talked to four people, 
three of whom were actively concerned with the rising. The fourth was Irish dramatist Mr. Bernard Shaw, who had this to say from his home in London. It's all quite ridiculous. They're making asses of themselves. An Irishman resorting to arms is only doing what Englishmen will do if it be their misfortune to be invaded and conquered by the Germans in the course of the present war. The fact that he knows that his enemies will not respect his rights if he is captured means that he must fight with a rope around his neck. And this adds to his glory in the eyes of his compatriots and in the eyes of disinterested admirers of patriotism throughout the world. The shot Irishmen will now take their places beside Emmett and the Manchester martyrs in Ireland and beside the heroes of Poland and Serbia in Europe. And nothing in heaven or earth can prevent it. Earlier today, I spoke to General Sir John Maxwell at Dublin Castle. General Maxwell, many people are shocked by your decision to execute the leaders of this insurrection. Now, do you have any comment on that? That decision, as you call it, was not made by me. The court's martial pronounced sentence, I did not. Ah, oh, yes, but surely it was you who confirmed the sentences. Yes, I did. I may say I looked into each case on its merits. The rebels, when you look into it, got off quite lightly. By being executed? By being shot. We could very easily have hanged them, you know, like common criminals. Instead, we allowed each one of them to die a soldier's death. Ah, oh, yes, but General Maxwell, if you regard them as soldiers, then surely they should have been treated as prisoners of war. I do not regard them as soldiers. They are rebels. As to the manner of their execution, that is a concession made by myself. It is not something they're entitled to. Well, even so, General Maxwell, will you agree that the sentences were rather harsh? Most of the rebels got off with terms of imprisonment. To execute merely a dozen or so of the ringleaders, that, to me, doesn't seem excessively harsh. No, I cannot agree with that at all. Well, are you not afraid that these men will now be regarded as martyrs? I think that unlikely. Yes, but these executions coming as they do immediately after the North King Street murders. Murders? I should like to emphasize that responsibility for any loss of life, however it occurred, rests entirely with those who engineered this revolt and who, at a time when the Empire is engaged in a gigantic struggle, invited the assistance and cooperation of the Germans. All complaints alleging brutality by our troops will, of course, be inquired into. But I'm happy to note that in spite of such allegations, the people of Dublin continue on excellent terms with the troops, even in North King Street itself, which I visited yesterday. I saw the soldiers talking in the friendliest way with the women at their door. Well, thank you, General Maxwell. Indeed, I think that the popularity of the soldiers in Dublin today is most gratifying and is one of the best possible proofs of the exaggeration, to say the least of it, shown in these allegations. General Maxwell, thank you. Not at all. Pleasure. This morning, the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Herbert Asquith, arrived in Dublin. We managed this to... This is Jerry Alexander at Dublin Castle. An ambulance has just driven up, and judging by the presence of armed troops and the lateness of the hour, 3.35 a.m., it seems as if... Yes, now, somebody is being brought out of the building, someone on a stretcher. Yes, the man on the stretcher is James Connolly. For a moment, we saw his face distinctly. There is no longer any doubt. He is Connolly and he's on his way to the execution yard at Kilmainham. Well, while we wait for the ambulance to cover the two miles between Dublin Castle and here, we bring you a filmed interview with the Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Herbert Asquith, this afternoon, Mr. Asquith paid a visit to Richmond Barracks. As he was leaving, Maury Taylor spoke to him. Sir, can you spare us a moment? Yes, what is it? What are the reasons for your visit to Ireland? Well, the main reason is that I wanted to study the effects of this unfortunate business at close hand. I shall, of course, be having talks with various people while I'm here. So far, 13 of the leaders of the insurrection have been executed. Do you hold with the view that these sentences are unnecessarily harsh? Not at all. 
I have the fullest confidence in whatever measures General Maxwell may deem it proper to take in the interests of restoring public order. Sir, do you think these executions will have an adverse effect on the recruiting drive in Ireland? No, quite the contrary. As far as I can see, this rebellion only serves to strengthen the uh, public's loyalty. The authorities here acted promptly and with firmness. I'm sure that uh, public confidence in the government is, in uh, the result of this, uh, stronger than ever. What about the charges of brutality by the military? Are you taking any action? Any such allegations will be fully looked into. General Maxwell tells me that he is ordering a military inquiry. But since these allegations are being made against the military, don't you think a civil inquiry might be more effective? Uh, I think that's an improper question. Does anyone suppose that Sir John Maxwell has any object in shielding officers and soldiers, if there be such, who have been guilty of such ungentlemanly, such inhuman conduct? It's the last thing that the British Army would dream of. What about the shooting of Mr. Francis Sheehy Skeffington? Is it not true that Major Sir Francis Vane, the second in command of Portobello Barracks, has been dismissed from the army by General Maxwell because he accused Captain Bowen Colthurst of murdering Mr. Sheehy Skeffington? I'm sure that's not true. While I'm here, I shall be seeing Mrs. Sheehy Skeffington. Until then, I have no light to throw on the matter. Uh, one last question, Mr. Asquith. Baron Wimborne, the Lord Lieutenant, Mr. Beryl, the Chief Secretary, and Sir Matthew Nathan, the Under Secretary, all three have resigned their positions. Do you have any comment? There's to be a Royal Commission of Inquiry a week from today. No doubt the findings of the Commission will establish the degree to which these resignations are justified. Good day. Later today, we spoke to Major Sir Francis Vane, late second in command at Portobello Barracks. Is it true that you were dismissed from the army? Perfectly true. By whose authority, sir? By that of Sir John Maxwell. I see. Can you tell us something of the circumstances? Well, I believed, and still do, that Captain Bowen Coldhurst was responsible for at least six murders during the insurrection. Now, one of these was the shooting of Mr. Sheehy Skeffington. It's my opinion that Captain Bowen Coldhurst was deranged. I said so to General Friend, to Colonel Cannot, and to Major Price at Dublin Castle. And did they agree with you? No. They said I was trying to stir up a hornet's nest. In fact, Major Price said to me, some of us think that it was a good thing that she, his Skeffington, was put out of the way. Those were his exact words, sir? Yes. I see. What happened next? I went to London and attained an interview with Lord Kitchener. I told him what had happened and requested that Captain Bowen Coldhurst be relieved from command. Lord Kitchener assured me that he would send a telegram to General Sir John Maxwell ordering Captain Bowen Coldhurst's arrest. To your knowledge, was such a telegram actually sent? I believe so. But Captain Bowen Coldhurst was not arrested? No. Instead, I was informed that I had been deprived of my rank and dismissed from the service. By General Maxwell? Yes. And what further action do you propose to take, Sir Francis? None. As a civilian, I have no power and no influence. One can only hope that the relatives of the late Mr. Sheehy Skeffington will continue to press for an investigation. Sir Francis, in your opinion, is the execution of so far 13 men justified? These shootings have been carried out in the most brutally stupid manner. The execution of three of the senior chiefs would have been more than adequate for the purposes of justice. To kill these men at the rate of one or two a day is no more than wanton and senseless cruelty. Thank you, Sir Francis. The time is 3.40. I can see the lights of a motor vehicle, which is probably the ambulance bearing James Connolly to this place of execution. With Connolly will die Sean McDermott, who earlier tonight was visited by the Misses Mary and Phyllis Ryan. A priest has already been summoned to the prison and arrived here a short time ago. The ambulance is now going directly to the prison. And in another minute or two, the last shots of this insurrection will be fired. There is no doubt 
but that these men, Pierce, Connolly, Plunkett, McDermott and the others, have welcomed death as the only real victory. Pierce said at his court-martial, you cannot conquer Ireland. You cannot extinguish the Irish passion for freedom. If our deed has not been sufficient to win freedom, then our children will win it by a better deed. Freedom. What is it? You cannot see, touch, or hear it, but that applies to the air we breathe. Pierce was a poet, not a soldier. And perhaps his freedom was of a rarefied nature which can never really exist. Or perhaps it can. Who knows? In this year of 1916, it's hard to say. The insurrection is over. Or is it? Good night.